Well, this morning, as I told you during our prayer time, Chaplain Pearsall had a, a family emergency that he had to attend to, so uh, he was supposed to preach to you this morning, but you got me instead. And y'all can complain about that later if you need to. Amen? Y'all can help me out by laughing, all right? This is a safe space. But in any case, I also am going to preach next Sunday, but that was scheduled anyway. And I was go I'm going to preach next Sunday from the book of John, chapter number 14. And then when I got the call yesterday from Chaplain Pearsall uh, telling me that he wasn't going to be able to be here today, I started thinking about what can I bring on the fly. Y'all ever had, a, had a, a situation where you wasn't necessarily expecting to to uh, have to take care of something, but then at the last minute you learned that you did have to take care of it? Now, if there's anybody that uh, is amongst us that may at some point um, nurture a call to the ministry, let me, let me throw that out to you right now, that sometimes you do have to come up with a sermon on the fly. But it's okay, because as long as God is in it, it's going to work. See, if man is in it, it's going to fail every time. But if God is in it, nothing's impossible, right? Amen. With that being said, I'm going to start John chapter 14 this morning, and we'll go further into it next week. That sound good? Amen. All right, so I'm going to, um, I'm going to direct you to um, John chapter 14, and we're going to start in verse number 1. No doubt a very, very familiar passage to, in, to all of us. And I forgot to say something. I see some people without Bibles. There are some on the back table. If you'd like one, you don't, you don't have to get it back. You can keep it. But I'm going to turn your attention to John chapter number 14 this morning. And I'm going to be honest with you. I was thinking along the lines of John chapter 15. But that's another sermon for another day. But while you're finding your place in John chapter 14... How many in here has ever done any gardening? Okay. Yesterday, I was out in, in what my mediocre garden might be, uh, might be construed as, and I was kind of pruning my tomato plants a little bit. And don't, have you ever noticed that all through life, when we're faithful to God, we always seem to be getting pruned? We always seem to have something come at us. See, that's what I was thinking yesterday when Chaplain Pearsall called me. That, you know, we can be going along, doing what we're doing, and then way out of left field, something occurs. And a lot of times, those things will cause us to question our faith, no doubt. But we do well to remember that... As people of faith, we're always going to be pruned. Why? Because God expects the best out of us. So that's covered in John chapter 15, but I wanted to kind of bring that up to you. Because we're going to talk in John chapter 14, and we're going to look a little bit at that. Or at that concept. Not necessarily of pruning, but the concept of difficulties. John chapter 14, starting in verse number 1. Like I said before, no doubt a very familiar passage. Jesus tells us these words. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Verse number four, And where I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Verse number six, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this morning I'm going to preach on this subject, a text for troubled hearts. Let's pray. And now, God, I, I just pray that in this time of our worship, when we look to your word, when we hear it read, and when we hear it preached, Lord, I pray that you would just abound among us, that your spirit would just walk with us at this point. May, may every word that's said this morning be what you would have said. 
And Lord, may your spirit challenge us, may it convict us. Lord, over and above anything that I could ask, if there is but one among us that does not know Christ as Lord and Savior, let they not leave this building this morning until they've made that decision for salvation, which is found in one place and in one place only. We just read it from John chapter 14 and verse number 6, and that is in Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that I ask you to pray. And the church said, Amen. Have you ever noticed this text right here is one that meets us in the most tough, troubled times of our life? I've said it many, many times to people who seem to have lost their way. And I've said to them, a lot of times you might not know where to find the answer in Scripture. You know it's in there, but you don't know where to find it. Simply open the book and it'll meet you exactly where you are. And that's something that John chapter 14, especially the passage that we just read, verses 1 through 6, does. It meets us right there in times of trouble, in times of difficulty, in times of tribulation. It is one of the most familiar sets of verses in the New Testament. Second only, I expect, to John chapter 3 and verse 16. It's often associated with death and funerals. Why? Because of what I just said. It meets us in the tough times of life. Anytime I've ever uh, preached a graveside, I always use John chapter 14 and verses 1 through 6 because it meets us in the toughest times of life. And its message reaches to every troubled heart. I don't know what some of you are carrying this morning. Somebody in our midst may have something very troubling upon their heart. But this text reaches to every troubled heart. It's a text that takes us from trouble to triumph. Why that triumph? Because of what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth. And we can't doubt that we face times of trouble. Be it trouble that we face currently, or if you don't face any, hang on because you will at some point. We can't doubt that we face times of trouble, but we don't have to let that trouble have us. Because if you know Christ this morning, you've already been victorious over that trouble. But this text finds us in those places of trouble. So I want to share with you a couple of points about this particular text that illustrates how it meets us in times of trouble. And the first is this. It's a text that calls us to peace in times of peril. It's a text that calls us to peace in times of peril. Think about the context here. We, we are in the, the portion of the Gospel of John where it's Jesus and the disciples in the upper room. It's Jesus and the disciples that there by themselves. It's no longer amongst all the crowds that we see during the ministry of Christ in the New Testament. It's simply Jesus and his disciples in the upper room. And we see that starting in chapter number 13. Some of you may have heard me say this last week. When you get into John chapter 13, you get into that point where we see Jesus educating his disciples on the things that they're going to need to know because he's getting ready to leave them. But they're going to be charged with building the foundation of the church here on earth. Building the foundation of what we're doing this morning. Building the foundation of what countless other uh, groups of Christians are doing this morning. So in chapter number 13, I'm not going to read very much of it. I might read a couple of pieces of it. But I just want you to consider it for context. They've come to Jerusalem for the Passover. And so they're up there in the upper room and they experience, they experience a pleasant meal. They experience that precious fellowship. And then you see in another account where Jesus does that act of servanthood where he washes the disciples' feet. But then he reveals that there's going to be tough times ahead. Verses 21 through 30 of uh, chapter number 13 
Jesus reveals that there's going to be a betrayal. And then further on, he, he, he reveals that there's going to be a denial. See, Jesus tells those disciples that one among them is going to betray him. And then he tells those disciples that one among them is going to deny him. You see, there were tough times that Jesus had to prepare his disciples for. And you can read the accounts throughout the rest of the New Testament as those apostles were laying the foundation of the church. And you could see that, yes, there were tough times ahead. It just goes to, it just stands to reason that there's going to be tough times for us all. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 16 and verse number 33, at the end of that sort of uh, upper room discourse that we see from John chapter 13 to John chapter 16, he says, in the world you shall have tribulation. Now I got news for you right there. You know Christ is Lord and Savior. You know that Jesus is God himself. If God tells me I'm going to have trouble, that means I'm going to have trouble. Most people, probably should better say all people, will go through things they never thought they'd go through. Some, most, all will go through things that we never thought we would. And think about this one. Many, most, some, all will go through things they didn't think they could. We had a prayer request about basic trainees just a little while ago. How many of you all got off the bus at Fort Jackson or wherever you went and you didn't know if you could do what you've laid out to do? How many of you got off that bus and said to yourself, what on earth have I gotten myself into? I got news for you. You will continue to ask yourself that question however long you stay in the Army. I remember asking myself that question the first time I stepped off the plane in Kuwait. And then a couple days later, when I stepped off the back of the C-17 in Iraq. And then later on in Afghanistan. You see what I'm saying? No matter how long you're in the Army, you're going to ask yourself that question. What did I get myself into? But here's the good news. You didn't think you could make it, but you're at Fort Lee now. You're not at Fort Jackson anymore or Fort Sill or wherever you went. You made it down Victory Tower. I didn't get a lot of amens on that one. It must have been easy for y'all. It was tough for me because I hate heights. Do y'all know the chaplain schools at Fort Jackson? We had to go down Victory Tower, too. And I didn't think I could. But thank God I did, or else I guess I probably wouldn't be standing here right now. But you see what I'm saying there. All of us will go through things that we have no clue if we can do it. It's a fact of life. May I remind you what Christ tells us at the end of that discourse? In this world, you shall have tribulation. But there's another part to that verse, isn't it? When he says, but. Aren't you glad when you see Jesus say the word but because something wonderful is going to come right after it? But. Be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. So I said just a little while ago, you know Christ is Lord and Savior. You overcome the world with him. So you don't have to worry about what goes on out in the world. Oh, yes, it'll be difficult. Oh, yes, you'll get scared. But you don't have to worry about it because you're already victorious over it. Maybe you're here this morning. It's not invitation time yet. But maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Christ. You don't know that victory. The good news is you can have that victory. You can have that victory that Christ won. But even... Though we have trouble, even though we deal with tough times, even though we have tribulation, Christ said what in verse number one? Let not your heart be troubled. It reminds me a whole lot of what God told Joshua back in the Old Testament. Be not afraid. 
For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And we can be peaceful even in perilous times. We know Christ is Lord and Savior. We've already won the victory, so we can have peace. Oh, it's okay to fear. But it's not okay for fear to have you. We can be peaceful. But not only is it a text that calls us to peace in times of peril, it's a text that calls us to trust in times of trouble. You notice there in verse number one, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Believe, that's a life-changing word right there. To believe is to exercise faith. A lot of times I'll have a soldier in my office and I'll ask them about their faith journey and they'll tell me that they're a Christian and I'm like, awesome, you've got a foundation of faith to build on. It's just simply exercising that faith. What does Paul tell us in the book of Hebrews? He says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then we're also admonished to believe and be saved. In Acts chapter 16 and verse number 31. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your household. So believe and be saved. Believe and get your prayers answered. In Mark chapter 9 and verse number 23, Jesus said unto him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. You believe in God, you believe in Christ, all things are possible. A minute ago I talked about going through things that we never thought we could go through. You believe. And all things are possible. See how cool that scripture aligns exactly with what you're taught in the army? A minute ago I talked about Victory Tower. And somehow or another we were all made to believe we could come down it safely. And what did we do? We believed it. And it happened. See how, see how that runs parallel with what we learn in scripture? Believe and all things are possible. Verse number, uh, verse number one, Christ says you believe in God. Number one, faith that God exists and how on earth anyone can look at the creation around them and not believe that there is a divine creator is way beyond me. So I'm not even going to try it. Belief, faith that God exists and faith that he is the creator. And then even better, and this is going to be a tough one. Faith that God is in control. That's hard for us sometimes. No doubt among us that that's hard for us sometimes. Because why? We want to control it all. We want to be in control of our destiny. We want to be in control of everything that happens. And then more often than not, what do we find? We find that soon that burden gets too heavy to bear. And all of a sudden we're going down into the depths of depression. And not knowing which way is up. But we must have faith that God is in control. Let me share something with you here. No doubt you know that we're going through very difficult days in our country right now. And it's very, very easy for us to look at reports, look at news, look at those kind of things, and start to get fearful, start to get frustrated, start to wonder, will it ever let up? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know this. Whatever it happens... God is still in control. So yes, it's hard to, to have that faith that God is in control, but we must do it. Because if it was easy, we wouldn't have any need, right? So Christ said you believe in God. Then he said, believe also in me. Believe that Jesus came to save sinners. That was Jesus' mission. You can look in the story of creation way back in Genesis, and you can look at the fall of man, but then you can look at the prophecy that God gives. We call it a messianic prophecy that he would send salvation. Why? Because he didn't give up on us. Aren't you glad this morning that God didn't give up on you? Aren't you glad this morning that even though we were wretched and we were children of the original sin, that God still loved us? Amen. 
and still gave the means to save us. So believe that Jesus came to save sinners. Believe that Jesus died to pay for our sins. Every sin you, me, and all of us have committed, will commit, or think about committing, Christ paid for it on the cross. And if you know Christ this morning, your sins have been washed away. You're not going to have to account for them. Aren't you glad about that this morning? Aren't you glad that if you know Christ, your sins are covered and you don't have to account for them? Believe that Jesus rose from the dead. What did he do when he did that? He gave us the victory over the grave. Oh yes, one day this body will fail and we'll go to the grave. But thank God because of God's love for me, because of God's love for you, he gave Jesus Christ to pay that penalty, to take that, that, uh, those sins to the cross, to rise from the grave so we don't have to fear the grave. And then it's more than that, it's acting on this belief. That's trusting Christ for salvation. Now, my prayer is that everybody under the sound of my voice this morning knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But if you don't, trust Christ. Christ for salvation and then rest your future in his hands. And rest your future in his hands. Let me ask you something. We talked about basic training. You rested your success in basic training in the hands of your drill sergeant, right? And to a lesser extent here, you have to do that. And if we're capable of doing that, certainly we're capable of resting our future, our life in Jesus Christ. And so lastly, it's a text that calls us to look beyond life's difficulties. Now, that's another hard one for us, looking beyond those difficulties. But Jesus said this in verse number two, in my Father's house are many mansions. Now, I love that term, mansions. I know that some different translations might say dwelling places or something like that. I like the word mansions. Because thankfully, because I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I've got a mansion over the hilltop. I don't know if y'all ever heard that song before. It's an awesome song. Might play it one day over my uh, playlist or something. But if you know Christ, you've got a mansion over the hilltop. And something that my wife is very thankful for, in that mansion, the kitchen never gets dirty. In that mansion... We don't have to worry about making the beds. In that mansion, we don't have to worry about cleaning up. That's what you call perfect right there. But we must look beyond life's difficulties. All trouble here is temporary. I'll say it again. All trouble here is temporary. Do I know the end of that trouble? No. But I do know it's temporary. I know that trials are only seasonal. Basic training, I go there again. It was seasonal. Day one, you probably couldn't see the end of it. And it's okay. 27 years ago when I went to Lackland Air Force Base, I couldn't see the end of it from day one either. But trials are only seasonal. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Trials are seasonal. And the best is yet to come. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, Paul tells us this. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what shall I choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a de desire to depart and to be with Christ which is far better. See, basically what Paul is telling us there is that he would like to just go on to heaven and be with Christ, but he also likes being here to minister to the people. The best is yet to come. Trials are seasonal. Trouble is temporary. But the best is yet to come. How many in here like apple pie? Me too. So think about this. I'm going to give you all a story about what happens in my family's house at holiday time, be it Thanksgiving, be it Christmas. Great big meal, and then um, 
My mom always does this. She'll always put the dessert on a smaller plate, but she always tells us this. If you want dessert, hold on to your fork. Trials are temporary. Troubles are seasonal, but hold on to your fork because the best is yet to come. And heaven awaits all believers. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. We are confident, yes, well pleased to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Heaven awaits for all believers. The troubles, trials, temptations, they happen on earth. It's a, it's a product of the original sin, but heaven awaits all believers. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And then he said, I will come again. It's the blessed hope of every believer. The home in heaven or the return of Christ. One of the two is going to happen in our lifetime. Either we will leave this life and go on to the next one, or Christ will come back. And that's the blessed hope of every believer. So the question I have for you today, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of trouble, in the midst of trial and temptation, are you ready for His return? Are you ready for His return? And that's something you must ask yourself. Like I said a minute ago, my prayer is that everybody under the sound of my voice this morning is ready for Christ's return. If you're not, you can be made ready today. And it's as simple as placing your faith in Christ. Why? Because God loves you and he gave Christ for you. And all you have to do is simply place your faith in what Christ did for you. And so here we have John chapter 14. A text for troubled hearts. Your hearts might be troubled, but you can be at peace because of what Christ did for you. Let's bow our heads and pray.